here on the uh, end of the aisles. If you guys would take these and either find your name or flip to the back and write it in, we appreciate it. For anyone who happens to not have a pen, ask a neighbor. Somebody by you there might be able to help you out. Well, much of there are many different streams of the church that are entering into a time that's commonly called Lent, and uh, that's during that time are getting ready for uh, having their focus on on Jesus dying on the cross. And um, in order to do that, many many traditions will take uh, about forty days and and give something over. Give something up to the Lord. And uh, so you may want to do that. It begins on Wednesday. My wife and I are, are looking at uh, giving up any negative talk, dis discouraging words over for the next 40 days. And so maybe, maybe something's on your heart to, to give up, <laughs> give to the Lord. I want to pray for our kids. Uh, Hannah's going to be taking them back here in just a moment. And they're going to have a fun time with her. So, Father, we just bless these children. We thank you that you see them and they're with you. Pray that they would have a fantastic time. And uh, you would just rock their world in a powerful way. I thank you that they're created in your image and you're crazy about them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Hannah. Hannah is... Uh, also taking over, overseeing, coordinating our uh, children's ministry. So if you're interested in loving on children and, and helping them to really grow in the heart of God, please talk to Hannah. She'd love to connect with you about that. Because we don't, we don't want to give our children the leftovers of our lives. Right? We want to show them that Jesus is with them and in them and that anything is possible. And so... If you're, you're interested in, in loving on these powerful people, then uh, talk to Hannah because it would be a, a really great time. Amen. Well, uh, we have this beautiful painting over here. And is, uh, if you're, you guys are familiar with our culture here of art going in and touching people's lives, and uh, I believe this was painted by Mary McCarty. Uh, they have a, a little one that's under the weather today, and so they're actually, I believe, watching us online. Hey, guys. Beautiful painting. And uh, so uh, we just like to hear from God and, and see what he has to say about some uh, reason something was painted and, and who it can go to. And I really felt like God showed this to me, and it's for Louisa here. Would you come on up here, please? This is our friend, Louisa. And uh, um, this painting here, you can see like the, the yellow. And, and just what I felt like the Lord was drawing my attention to was the yellow was like a sunlight. And then you have these beautiful purple flowers here. And uh, as I was praying for you this morning, I just felt like the Lord told me two things for you. And one of them is, uh, both of them are season change, okay? And one of them is God's bringing you into a season change. And that there are some things um, that you walk through in past environments and past seasons. And God is shutting the door on some of those. And it's really entering into a new time for you. And there are some things I believe that you've been praying for for years and some dreams that God's put on your heart many years ago that uh, I feel God is saying now is a time for some of these, some, some creative ideas and some things that you're like, I don't know how that would happen. Uh, but there, there's a new season where there's favor resting over, over your life and uh, that God is highlighting you. And I also felt the other word is also season change as well, but this is that you are a season changer. And so that God is bringing you into a season change. And even today where, you know, snows could be falling and all that kind of stuff, and we have a picture, it's like summer, right? 
Uh, and uh, I, I just feel like not only is God bringing you into a season change, despite the snow that's going to be falling here, um, that uh, you're also somebody that God will use and is using to bring other people into a different season. And so that interacting with you uh, is where you, by the help of the Spirit, bring people into a different place in their life. And here you have these flowers that are color purple, which represents royalty. And what I see over your life is that you're bringing people into a new season where they are able to have fresh hope and recognize the value that rests over their lives. And there's a, a strong ability that you have to bring uh, a, a real sense of identity and, and value to someone else, to see past the, it's kind of like the, the diamond in the rough. And that when people would see a certain people or a situation, they would see just the rough. And you said, no, 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 let's dig a little deeper. There's a diamond in there. And uh, you're somebody that helps to s people to, to remove the, the rough that's around, the rough edges and the rough stuff, and to really have uh, a, a place of beauty and that value and that, that royalty that comes out from in the midst of that. And so uh, I just want this to be something that, that helps you to celebrate a new time in your life. There's some things God is cutting away, some things that aren't following you. Uh, I feel like there's some things that have followed you through different seasons. And God said, enough is enough. Those are done. This is a new season, a new chapter in your life. And then also that uh, a reminder that by the Spirit of God, by his power, you have the power to bring other people into a new season. And that just interaction with you takes them to a different place in life and what's possible. So bless you. You're amazing. Would you guys extend your hands here? We just want to pray. We just want to pray for this lovely lady here as well. Father, we just thank you. We thank you, God, that she's not here by accident. Lord, but this is family, and we love her, and we bless her, God. We celebrate who you made her to be, the gifts that rest over this life. We thank you that she's royalty. And she's a daughter. I thank you, Lord, for a new season, cutting away some of those things and just bringing her bringing a new season now in Jesus' name, a new season where there's fresh life, where the flowers seem to float in the air, a new season of royalty, of favor, of provision, Lord, and a, and a new season to celebrate and to enjoy the shining of your favor on her face. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, thank you. Share. Bless you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, who here gets our e-bulletins? We email them out. Let me see your hands. If you don't, please make sure you're writing legibly on our uh, Connect attendance forms because there are quite a few announcements and things that go on that we don't have time to highlight on Sunday morning. And so please uh, check that out. Make sure you're reading those. We also put videos on there. If you notice this past time, I put a, a, a video of someone that was healed. Just something to encourage your day. Sometimes we'll put on there a funny video. Sometimes we'll put in a testimony video. Uh, different things on there just to brighten your day and to meet you where you're at. And, and uh, we're looking at some other things that we'll incorporate into our e-bulletins as well to have them a little more encouraging and interactive for you. So you want to make sure that those aren't going to spam, but you take some time to look at them and because they do have some important information. And some of them, information on there will be repeated for people as they're, they're new to Convergence Center. Uh, don't let, because you look at something and go, I know that's happening, and not read the rest of it. Because typically there is some new information on just about every one of the e-bulletins. And so if you have read something, keep scrolling down because there's probably something new on there that you, you haven't looked at. So make sure you're looking at those because we don't want to take up all of Sunday morning with the announcements, but they are important stuff, okay? So we're, we're sitting out in an e-form, e-format, and uh, seeing how this works. So uh, feel free to reply to those emails. If you have any questions or something, you can hit reply and, and we'll get that to you. Get, get replies from me if you have questions or something like that. Amen? Amen. All right, cool. Uh, so make sure you check those out. I do want to highlight that um, 
not next week, but the week after, we have a special guest speaking. Her name is Kim Hazlett. And if you have, anyone here has heard of Bob Hazlett, this is his wife. And my, Micah and I have been so blessed and touched by her, uh, interacting with her. And she is incredibly talented uh, in her own right, has some CDs and things that she'll bring. And so this is a, a great time to invite somebody. It's going, we're really, really excited that she's coming over to minister here in Convergence. And she's excited, too. So we've been emailing back and forth. She's excited to come. And so that's not this coming Sunday, but Sunday after that. Uh, next Sunday, I am planning on speaking. It partly depends on when our baby is showing up. So uh, there will church will be happening next week, if whether or not we happen to be in the building or not. And so uh, any help with setup and that kind of stuff, anybody wants to help do that, uh, um, please see Matt Hennedy or just come here at about 8.15 and um, be able to help with that, uh, especially next week because I don't know what's going to happen. So uh, we'll make sure everything is set up. appreciate the help that's already been coming, and, all, and that's, it's just been really good. And we've been having a fun time in our uh, pre-service training, and we're listening to... Uh, Jamie Galloway today on the prophecy, and that's been fun. So that's continuing on next week as well. Cool. So those are just a couple things. Please read your, your e-bulletin, and I've uh, got some more, some more exciting things coming. And I, I want to tell you early, but I can't. So uh, some things I'm excited about that's going to be happening. Amen. So here in just a moment, we are going to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. But uh, before those things are, are reached into and pulled out, uh, I really felt that we want to make our time of giving very meaningful. It's not something that we just check off and just do. Uh, and uh, we want to make it meaningful. And, th and here's a way that we're going to do it. We're starting something new today and uh, just to, to help bring more meaning to, uh, to the time where we're giving to the Lord. We're going to have a time of a public unified prayer over uh, our time of giving. And so we have a two-part prayer we're going to put here on the screen. And the first part are seven affirmations, and the second part is seven thanksgivings. And so these are where we'll say these out loud to the Lord. These are prayers, but we're saying these out loud to the Lord before we give and presenting that to him. And so if you guys would stand, we're going to bring this up on the screen, and I'm going to open in prayer and then when we're done with this, we, have, uh, we can pass out any envelopes people need as well. But we're going to pray this first before we do that. All right, so if you guys want to get ready with the envelopes. We have this, these prayers here. We'll begin with our affirmations. I'm going to start in prayer, and then I'll let you know uh, when we'll all pray together. So, Father, we dedicate this time to you, and we want to bring a meaningful experience with our offering. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Let's pray this together, starting up here. I affirm that giving you my money is a meaningful act of worship. I affirm that I give to you with a cheerful heart. I affirm that I am giving to you in obedience. I affirm that I am giving you my best and not my leftovers. I affirm that I give to you as a loved child with a good heavenly father. I affirm that I trust you to use my offering to glorify Jesus Christ. I affirm that I believe what you said in the Bible about giving and receiving. Let's bring up our thanksgiving. All right, let's pray. Thank you for giving me all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Thank you for freedom from a greed and poverty mentality. Thank you for the blessing of Abraham through Jesus Christ. Thank you for protection from the devourer. Thank you for creative ideas, bonuses, raises, favor, jobs, finances, and a godly work ethic. Thank you for the responsibility to steward what you have blessed me with. Thank you for abundance so that I am able to give in any situation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. And that was a prayer directly to God. We want to introduce this to a weekly basis. If you have, uh, you, if you want, need an envelope, please raise your hand. These guys can come and hand you an envelope. 
you do receive through credit card, uh, or if you have cash, you want to write your information on there, feel free to do that as well. Uh, and our one request is that you don't go into debt giving to the church, but that these affirmation and thanksgivings are true. Do you guys like that? Amen. These are good things to affirm and pray into, uh, and it, that it's a meaningful thing that we do. Now, last week I introduced that 10% of our offering was going to a missionary, a friend of ours in India, that is a um, former ministry school student named Jackie Kohler. She is ministering to widows in India who have no livelihood, and they're helping to uh, create jewelry and give them some tools so they can survive because in that culture when you're uh, a, a widow there's not a, a good place to even be able to survive economically so I'm extending that to this week so that our amount that we're sending to help these widows uh, is, is something more significant and so we're extending that over this week also 10 percent plus last week we're going to go over to the widows and Jesus said this is pure religion, right? Amen. Jesus is the word, right? I know when you, it wasn't in the Gospels where he said it, but Jesus is the word. And so Jesus said, this is pure religion, that you take care of the orphans and widows. And so that's what they're doing. They're doing pure religion, and we get to join in with that, with our giving. And so uh, we celebrate that happening here. If you guys want to come up to the front, we'll uh, bless this, and we'll receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Amen. All right. Just take your gift in your hand before the Lord. Father, I bless the gift here. I thank you they've given uh, as already affirmed and, thank, and with thanksgiving. And I pray for a multiplication over their lives. I thank you that you give seed to the sower and I ask that you would surprise them, that you would surprise them with the favor and the blessing that's over their lives. So we dedicate this in worship to you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Cool. Thanks, guys. We got here in the front row as well. All right. While we're receiving that, it is our pleasure to hear from one of our family, one of our friends here, Rachel Concannon. She is a third year ministry school student. Uh, but besides that, she's also a staff member with us at Convergence Center and is a trusted friend and uh, somebody that the hand of God is on. And she has a message from God today. I'm really, really excited. And so she grew up in a church background. Her, her parents are pastors in New Jersey. And uh, Mike and I have ministered in their church and good, good friend of us, quote quality people. She really has a fantastic background and loves the Lord and walks in truth and power and humility as well. And so just a, a really, really good person to get to know. If you haven't talked with Rachel, please do because she's amazing. She's worth spending some time with and getting to know because she has truth in her and, and just a, a powerful, powerful person. So it's really fun to have Rachel here today. Would you guys welcome Rachel Concannon bringing the word this morning? Amen. pleasure to be up here speaking today. It's an honor to be on staff here at this work and uh, to be under uh, Ben and Micah and just to serve them. And it's just been an amazing growing experience for me. And I'm just um, so honored to be up here to share the message today. So thank you. And I'm just really excited to share what God has put on my heart for the message today. I, I, was, I had been praying a lot about like, God, what do you want me to share? What do you want me to share? And he really put a few things on my heart, and I'm just excited to lay those out for you. Uh, the three things that I'll be speaking on is identity and the attitude of the heart, intimacy, and love. Three things that I believe are very important to our walk as followers of Christ. Some of the questions that I hope to answer today are, what does it look like? to stand strong in who God says we are and not what it looks like our circumstances are determining us as? What does it mean to walk in intimate fellowship with our creator 
and how do we walk out love in our lives? Those are things I'm going to be covering today, and I'll also be jumping around in the Bible a little bit, so if you guys want to follow along and get out your Bibles, e-Bibles, Bible apps, all those fun things that we have today. Um, I'm going to dive right in and start reading from a passage in John. Uh, recently, I had started reading uh, through the book of John in the Passion Translation, which is just, I've just discovered things and had revelation about things that I've never noticed before because of the uniqueness of this translation. And one of the things that really uh, struck me was in John 13, 37 through 38. They read, Peter the rock said, what do you mean I'm not able to follow you now? I would sacrifice my life to die for you. Jesus answered, would you really lay down your life for me, Peter? Here's the absolute truth. Before the rooster crows in the morning, you will say three times that you don't even know me. So Peter, who Jesus predicted would deny him, is the same one who also gave Peter the name the rock. And that really struck me as I read that, that every time Peter is referred to in this translation, they say Peter the rock. And that really struck me how God, who knows all things, knew that Peter would be the one to deny him. Peter is the one who Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. Peter is the one who uh, was impetuous and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant when they came to take Jesus away. But that never changed the fact that he was the rock upon whom God was going to build his church. No matter all the mistakes that he made, he was still Peter, the rock. Jesus, when he messed up, Jesus wasn't like, okay, now you're just back to Simon. You're not Peter anymore. You're off the team. Goodbye. Like, no. Yeah. And it's interesting because reading through this again, God just kept highlighting Peter to me over and over again. And it seems like the poor guy was just always saying something wrong. Like, he just... He was the disciple who was either too impetuous or boastful, oh, I'll be the one to die for you, and then he's the one that denies him. And then um, they come to the Mount of Transfiguration, and he's like, oh, let's build tabernacles to all these guys. And Jesus is like, no, we're not doing that. Jesus is like, I'm going to die for your sins. He's like, may that never be. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Like, it was just, he always was saying something wrong, it seemed. But that didn't change the fact that when he came onto God's team, that God gave him a new identity. And what he did never changed who he was. Amen. God didn't love Peter any less because he didn't always do the right thing or say the right thing. God still used him mightily. He was, um, on the day of Pentecost, we see in the book of Acts that Peter gave the first sermon in the history of the church. And on that day, um, hundreds and hundreds of people were saved, and God used Peter to heal, to perform miracles, to be one of the pillars of the early church even though he messed up a lot in the beginning. So God does not base our identity on what we do, but on who we are. Because when we step into God's family, he gives us a new identity as a son and a daughter. Amen. And likewise, God cares more about the attitude of our heart than he does our actions as well. So I want to focus for a few minutes um, on what matters to God most, which is our hearts. So as I said before, sometimes we think that our performance dictates our identity, but it's not. God has shown me um, in many ways that, and we see throughout his word in many ways, that he's most concerned with our heart and the attitude of our heart and how we come before him and how we present ourselves before him. Um, for example, last weekend I had gone home to my church in New Jersey and we had a guest speaker and there was like this awesome time of impartation and um, I was just slammed, and I felt God tell me very clearly, I want you to fast for three days. So I was like, all right, and I was like, so in the presence of God, I was like, yeah, I'm going to fast and do this, and afterwards I was like, oh, I have to fast. Like, uh, I don't, fasting is not something I enjoy doing. Like, um, some people that I know are just like, oh, I forgot to eat breakfast today. I'm like, how did you forget to eat? Like, I, that doesn't make sense to me. So I don't enjoy fasting. <laughs> Um, I began my first day of the fast, and I was at work. I work over at Goddard Daycare right across the street, and I was there, and like I said, a lot of my coworkers don't even eat 
breakfast in the morning and I get to lunchtime and I'm like, oh my gosh, I hate fasting. Like, I'm like, oh, it's only noon and I'm like starving. Um, and at nap time, when we put the kids down for nap, um, I usually take some time while they're asleep to pray and read my Bible. And um, it's nice, we have like relaxing music on. It's, it's nice. <laughs> so I was taking some time just praying and talking with God and all of a sudden I felt him say to me, I want you to stop fasting. And I was like, but you just told me to fast. And he was like, I know, but you're gonna go home tonight and you're gonna work more on your message for Sunday and I know you, you're not gonna be able to concentrate if you're hungry, so I want you to eat. And I was like, is that my stomach talking to me or is that God talking to me? Like, uh, I wanna be sure. So I was like, but God, like I'm willing to fast, like I'll do it, like I don't mind, are you sure? And he was like, no, he was like, what I care most about is that you were obedient, and I, I know that your heart is in the right place, and I know your heart that you are willing to fast the three days, and that's all I had to see. So now you can go eat. And I was like, wow. Like, God cared more about the attitude of my heart starting my fast than he actually did the performance of it. Amen. And then God said to me, he said, it's like when the little kids at work, when you tell them to clean up, and they're running around trying to help clean up, but they're putting everything in the wrong bin. He said, you're not gonna yell at them because they're putting the toys in the wrong bin. You're gonna appreciate their attitude of helpfulness and willingness to help clean up the room. And he said, that's what it's like right now. He said, I appreciate your, your attitude um, that you came to me with to fast. I know you're willing to do it. And that's all I had to see. And it just blew me away. And I'm by no means discounting fasting. That's, a very good thing to do, and I'm sure I'll do it again sometime, but <laughs> um, when God tells me to. But um, it just really was a great moment of revelation for me. And I want to read a verse in the Bible that um, talks about how God sees things, which is in 1 Samuel 16, 7. It says, but as the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And we see that, as I said before, just throughout scripture, that God really does care about our hearts. And another example in scripture that shows that is in Psalm 51. David had wrote Psalm 51 after, uh, right after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And it's just a beautiful biblical picture of repentance of David broken, coming before God, asking to be forgiven, asking to be cleansed, admitting his guilt. And I want to point out verses 16 and 17 of Psalm 51. It says, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Like we see there how David sinned and under like the Jewish law at that time, he could have made repentance. He could have brought all the pigeons and the goats and the sheep and all the things of that time and brought them to the temple and received atonement. But would it have really mattered? Because he knew that all, God didn't want that stuff. God just didn't want the death of animals to atone, like that, that wasn't where God's heart was. He wanted David's heart. And he knew that it would mean more to God if he was truly repentant than all the sacrifices in the world that he could perform. So God does not base um, our worth on our performance, but on who he says that we are. And before we go out there and do miracles and lay hands on the sick and um, prophesy and, and do all that great stuff for God, we first need to bring our hearts and minds in alignment um, with God's word and his heart and with who he says that we are. But how do we keep ourselves from straying from who God says that we are? How do we keep our hearts in the right place before him? How do we overcome sin in our lives? That brings us into the next point that I want to talk about, which is intimacy with God. What is intimacy? One of the definitions that stood out to me was familiarity. We need to get familiar with God and his ways and his word. But how do we do that? And what is the importance of intimacy with him? 
Well, how do you become intimate with someone, first of all? You become friends with them. You talk to them. You simply spend time in their presence. You get to know their likes and their dislikes. You are vulnerable and open with them. And that's what we need to do before our creator. Because if we want to show the world who our God is, we first need to get to know him intimately ourselves. As Christians, Jesus is our model for living. And we see throughout Jesus' life that going away and getting alone with God was very important to him. So important that he would leave crowds of people that were probably sick and needed healing and prophetic words and miracles, and he just would run away from them just to get alone and get back connected with the Father. Because he taught us that we can't do anything in and of ourselves, but only through staying connected to God. In, again, I'll be reading from the Passion Translation. I want to read John 5, uh, 19. So Jesus said, I speak to you timeless truth. I never act independently of the Father or do anything through my own initiative. I only do the works that I see the Father doing, for the Son does the same works as his Father. So Jesus, who was the Son of God, didn't do anything of his own initiative, and he modeled that for us so that we would know that we can't, it doesn't matter if we go out there and do all this stuff if we're not coming from a place of being connected with the Father. Another um, beautiful picture that Jesus states of what it looks like to be connected to him is found in John 15, 5 through 8. It's just a beautiful picture, um, especially in this translation, just how important it is to be connected to him. Jesus said, I am the sprouting vine, and you are my branches. As you live in union with me as your source, fruitfulness will stream from within you. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. If you live separated from me, you will be discarded like shriveled up branches that are gathered up and thrown into the fire to be burned. But if you step into my life in union with me, and if my words live powerfully within you, then you can ask whatever you desire, and it will be done. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are my mature disciples who glorify my Father. So, in order, we see from this verse that in order to bear fruit for God, we need to be connected to him. So if being connected to God comes out of friendship, what does being a friend of God look like? And what does it look like to cultivate that friendship? And here are a few passages of scripture that show us what that looked like. Again, I'll be going back to John 15, this time verses 14 through 17. And... Um, it's amazing because God had spoke to me and uh, told me that like he wanted me to speak about intimacy with him. And then the next day, I just happened to be up to reading John 15. And if you listen to the wording here, he literally uses the word intimate, which I know wasn't a mistake. He said, you show that you are my intimate friends when you obey all that I command you. I have never called you servants because a master doesn't confide in his servants. And servants don't always understand what the master is doing. But I call you my intimate friends, for I reveal to you everything that I've heard from my Father. You didn't choose me, but I've chosen and commissioned you to go into the world to bear fruit, and your fruit will last, because whatever you ask of my Father for my sake, he will give it to you. So this is my parting command, love one another deeply. So we see from that verse that being a friend of God looks like obeying his command, and the last command that he said my parting command is love one another deeply. You see how important it is to, if being a friend of God looks like loving somebody. So that's one important thing that I saw in scripture that shows us how we can be close to God. And another um, passage of scripture points out something different that shows us the importance of being connected to God as well. It's in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
that is a very, I think, a very powerful passage of scripture. Like, we could go out there and do all the stuff. We could go out there and um, lay hands on the sick. We could prophesy. We could do all that. But none of that matters if we don't, if we don't know God, if we aren't connected to him, if we don't um, have a close relationship with him. All the stuff doesn't matter. Amen. Like, we could go out there and do that. But, like, I remember the first time, like, um, like my first year at ministry school here, the ministry school that meets here at GSSM, and like you're just so like hyped up on all the stuff God is doing and uh, outreaches and praying for people and um, being the crazy Christians out there and getting thrown out of places. Like it's so exciting, but then like, and all that stuff is important. But when I read that passage of scripture during my first year of ministry school, I was like, oh, like wow, like all that stuff we need to do, but first we need to get close to God. That's the most important thing. And as it said, if we know Jesus, we'll do his will, as he said in that verse as well. And like I showed in the other verse in John, doing the will of God looks like loving somebody. And another um, portion of scripture that shows us this is 1 John 4, 7 through 11. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So if we want to look like God in this world, we need to look like love. One way that I like to think about intimacy with God is keeping our eyes focused on him. And I think um, a story in the Bible that shows us this is the story of when Peter gets out of the boat. Um, he said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out. He steps out on the water. He starts walking. He has his eyes focused on Jesus. But then as soon as he starts to focus on the wind and the waves and the storm, he starts to sink. And I really thought about that, how it's like that in life. If we stay connected to God, if we keep our eyes on him and what he's saying, we stay afloat in life, per se. But when we start to elevate our circumstances above God, when we start to focus more on the job that we lost, the bills that aren't paid, and um, the sickness in our body. When we give those things an elevated place above God, we start to sink. So if we keep our eyes focused on him and are intimately connected to our creator, we will live victoriously. Being an intimate friend of God is key to a healthy Christian life. Sin separated us from fellowship with God, but Jesus paid the price on the cross so that we could now come boldly before God and once again enjoy his presence. God has called us to live from heaven to earth, but we can only do that by staying connected to him. So another aspect of intimacy that I want to talk about is overcoming sin. Um, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were first placed there, they could walk and they could enjoy God's presence and talk and walk with him. And that must have been amazing, but when sin came into the picture, their immediate reaction was when God came looking for them, they were ashamed of their sin, and they ran and they hid. Um, but throughout scripture, we go through you know, history, and then we come to Jesus. Jesus came and he paid the price so that we no longer have to run and hide from God when we sin because we have forgiveness now. We can go to God. But I feel like sometimes, as Christians, when we mess up, we still tend to do that. We still tend to run and to hide from God, which we don't need to do because as it says in Colossians 1, 19 through 20, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So we've made peace with God through Christ. We no longer have to be ashamed. We no longer have to run and hide. We can run boldly to the throne of grace that now awaits us. 
Separation from God was the devil's plan from the whole start. And if we still let sin separate us from God, we are avoiding the grace that Jesus died for. I'm in no way saying that it's okay to sin because of the cross, but we need to stay. The only way to overcome sin is by staying connected to the only source that can free us from it. To me, it's just as much of a sin to ignore God's grace as to abuse it. If we stray from our only hope, we aren't going to go anywhere. And I found this to be very true in my life. Um, I just, for a period of a few years, this, I, that was me, like, when I would mess up, when I would fail, when I felt like I fell short of who I was supposed to be in God, I, would, I wouldn't want to pray. I didn't want to worship. I didn't want to read the word because I didn't feel worthy to enjoy God's presence. I didn't feel like I deserved to enjoy the love of God and the forgiveness of God. So I would not pray, not read my Bible, not worship for a few days until I felt okay again, like, oh, okay, I guess I'm a little bit of a better Christian today. Now I can worship and enjoy God's presence. And one day God spoke to me very clearly about that. He was like, you know you've fallen into a trap, right? And I was like, what trap? And he was like, the devil is using um, this to separate you from me. He said the only way the devil is going to stop plaguing you with these thoughts and feelings is if you come and stay connected to me because his goal is to separate you from me. You're missing days and days of praying with me and talking with me and walking with me because of this. And I just, like... I was just like, wow, <laughs> like I can't believe I fell into this trap. So that's what I did when I would mess up, when I felt like I wasn't doing the right thing or saying the right thing or being the Christian I was supposed to be, I would still stay connected to God. I would still pray. I would still worship. And eventually just the devil stopped annoying me as much. Those thoughts, those feelings didn't come back anymore because I wasn't letting it separate me from God. Amen. That's good. Word. In Colossians 1, 21 through 22, Continuing in that chapter, God says, And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death for, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. I just think that's amazing that because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we are above reproach in God's sight. We're blameless. We're pure. We no longer have to run and hide, but can come before him and receive full forgiveness because what sin did was separate us from enjoying the presence of God, but we no longer have to let that separate us from him. So when we mess up, let's not do as Adam and Eve did, but let's run boldly into his arms of forgiveness. What do you discover when you become intimate with your creator? the most amazing and unconditional love that you will ever discover. Amen. Just as it states in the Bible, God is love. So when we discover who God is, we discover true love. And it's only out of knowing God that we can become like him. And as I stated earlier, we want to be like our model, who is Jesus. And just like Jesus modeled for us what it looks like to be um, close with God and stay connected to him, Jesus also showed us what it looks like to love people. And I want to read from John 15, 9 through 13, where Jesus said, I love each of you with the same love that the Father loves me. Let my love nourish your hearts. If you keep my commands, you will live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, for I am nourished and empowered by his love. My purpose for telling you these things is so that the joy that I experience will fill your hearts with overflowing gladness. So this is my command, love each other deeply as much as I have loved you, for the greatest love of all is a love that sacrifices all. And when a person sacrifices his life for his friends, this great love is demonstrated. So Jesus showed countless ways that we can become love as he was on earth, ultimately in that he died on the cross for us. But as we see from there, a way to demonstrate love is to sacrifice, and we can sacrifice so many things um, in, our, in our daily lives to step out and show love to somebody. 
such as like when Jesus talked to us in Matthew 5 um, about going the second mile for somebody and what that looks like. So maybe in your life, what does it look like to become loved to somebody? What does it look like to go the second mile? Maybe it is um, inviting your neighbor over for coffee. Maybe it's talking to somebody that looks depressed at your job or a coworker that you know is struggling with something. Maybe it looks like inviting them or going out to lunch with them. So what does it look like in your daily life to be God? And like, what does it look like to, to give up, say, your, even your time and your talents for God? Just, there's so many ways that we can serve God and show love in this world. Because when you become love, then you show the world who God really is. Like, for me, um, stepping out of my comfort zone or sacrificing something would be like hospitality, inviting somebody over, talking to somebody, because I'm the type of person that I like to be alone. I love nothing better than a day by myself at home watching old murder mysteries from the 1930s. That's me, I love nothing better. So to me, stepping out and sacrificing my time to be with somebody and to invite somebody out to coffee that I know is struggling with something, that's a sacrifice for me. That's becoming love in my life. And so each of you, as you go about, you can find that thing that um, challenges you to sacrifice something and to go out of your comfort zone. But as I said before, it's not that, it's nothing that we do that earns the love of God, but it's simply being in his love and we're already qualified, we're already accepted and we just wanna show that to the world. And another example of that is in the movie, um, the Narnia movie, Prince Caspian. At the very end of the movie, um, when they make it to Aslan's country, um, uh, Caspian says how he's going to go back to the kingdom that his father left him. And, but then he says, like, I don't feel ready to be king. I don't think I'm ready. And then Aslan looks at him and says, it's for that very reason that you are ready. So sometimes the thing that we think that disqualifies us actually qualifies us in God's eyes. So we are qualified to become love in this world. We're qualified sons and daughters of God. Amen. And I want to read Amen. now a portion of scripture that shows us, the, again, the importance of love, which is found in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. I think that's amazing that it's basically saying you could go out there, you could do all the stuff, you could die, you could be a martyr, but if you don't have love, it doesn't mean anything. And so in our lives, we don't want to just go out there, we don't want to do, we don't want to just say, oh, guess how many people I prayed for this week, guess how many people I prophesied over, because it's not, if it's not coming out of a place of concern for the person, if it's not coming out of a place of love, it does not mean anything. Just like uh, Randy Clark, when he teaches about deliverance, we're not just focused on getting that uh, spirit out of the person. We're focusing on bringing the person back to a place of wholeness. It's coming out of a place of love for the person, that we want to lead them through healing. We want to lead them through restoration and forgiveness. So as we go out there and be the Christians that God has called us to be, we want to remember that, um, we, first of all, we want to remember who we are, that we are qualified. We are beloved sons of God. Or God <laughs> getting tongue-tied. Um, we are beloved sons and daughter, daughters of God, and that nothing that we could ever do could change God's love for us. And it's staying intimately connected to our source of love that we can ultimately be that love in the world. So just as we um, come to a close now, I just hope that each of you has been inspired to go further in your walk with Christ and I hope that you take away with you a greater understanding and appreciation of the amazing God of love that we serve. And I want to end with one more passage of scripture that assures us that nothing can separate us from that love, which is found in Romans 8, 
38 through 39. It says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So right now, as we close, I just wanted to take a few moments for us to spend um, a little bit of time with God and ask him a couple of questions that I think can seal this message in your hearts today. So I just want you to take a moment and just quiet your heart down before God. And I just want you to ask him to say, God, what is one thing that you love about me? So why don't you just go ahead and take a few minutes and ask God that. I'm just going to go ahead and throw the second question out there for you guys to ask as you're you're still spending time with God. I want you to ask God, how can I become love this week? Why don't you go ahead and ask that. I'll give you a few more minutes. I'm going to go ahead and pray over you guys as you're still hearing from God. God, I just pray that right now as we bring this service to a close, God, I just pray that you would speak to the hearts of each of your people, God, because that's the most important thing is hearing from you, God, spending time with you. So I just pray now, God, just as you're speaking to each of your children here, God, that they would just be overwhelmed by your love, God, overwhelmed by your acceptance of them, Lord. I just pray that you would just give each of your sons and daughters creative ideas on how they can become love in this world, how they can become love at their job, at their schools, at whatever they do, God. Just show them, give them creative ways to become love. I just pray that you just raise up an army of your people, God, an army of lovers of God, You can go out there and show the world what you really look like, which is love. So God, I just pray now that you just fill everybody here, God. Fill them up to overflowing with your peace, your love, 
your joy to overflowing, God. And I pray that as we leave here today, God, we would just leave with just a sense of awe of who you are, God, a sense of awe that you love us so much that you created a plan of redemption simply that, simply so that you could be with us again, so that you could walk in fellowship with us again, God. Let us pray blessing on every person here now, God, that this your blessing and your abundant joy would fill every heart here now. In Jesus' name, amen. That was the best message ever, according to David. Awesome. Um, as we're wrapping up here today, though, what she's talking about is not something that can be prayed on you. You can't pray on someone your intimacy with God, right? Uh, but you can receive the, in the invitation that uh, you are welcomed into intimacy with God and pursue that for yourself. Uh, that being said, you can be prayed for and encounter God. Maybe some of you are, uh, would like some prayer about things you're walking through or someone that you would like prayer for or something like that. And uh, I'm going to ask for Rachel and Ricky if they would stand over here in this area. In just a moment, we're going to need to set up the room because that's part of what we need to do here, getting ready for the ministry school. But they're going to be up here and if anyone would like some prayer for anything for yourself or someone else or just to talk more about the message, I'm going to have them up there so you guys can interact with, with Rachel and receive some prayer on those kind of things. So would you guys stand with me? We're going to close today out. And uh, as a reminder, as a demonstration of connection and love, uh, Esther has opened up her place and it will be open today. And so if you, any, you guys want to go hang out together over at Esther's right down the street from here, then uh, talk with her because it's a fun time of connecting together. So Father, I bless all these people. I thank you that you love them because you do. And you love them and you can't help yourself. So I just bless the, the intimacy with you to, to really grow and be a reality, not a theology. And not a, a desire or an abstract thought, but real life that's lived out. So I thank you for the open invitation to live in love and to live from love in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for healing, transformation, other fun stuff that you're still God. Even as we say amen and move tables around, I think that people will be encouraged and healed and blessed here today as they're prayed for as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. If you want to receive prayer, please go and see Rachel and Ricky. And if not, if you guys could help us to set up some of these tables, then we'll get, get this room set up. Amen.